Today's episode is all about the Russian Army's often overlooked AK-74 rifle. Sure, it doesn't get the same press as the AK-47 because the middle child always gets overlooked, I should know. When Russian soldiers stormed Crimea in 2014, everyone in the media said they were carrying AK-47s, which I'm sure probably triggered a lot of you out there because as you know, they were carrying the much underappreciated AK-74. Way to go media, get it together. But make no mistake, the rifle definitely continued the mythic-like status and tradition of its predecessor. In this video, I want to examine what made the AK-74 rifle so unique, and whether or not it was successful as a military firearm solution for the Russian army, and we'll try to understand whether its performance in the battlefield over the past few decades was a go or a no-go. Hopefully, even if you're familiar with the rifle, you'll learn something new here today. If you like getting your defense information from a washed up former average infantryman, then remember to fire an AK-74 round at the like and subscribe button before we begin. Since its creation in 1974, the Russian military has manufactured an outstanding 5 million of these AK-74s. Yeah, it's safe to say they love this weapon system. It was actually mandatory in the 1980s for young Russians in school to know how to field strip and assemble one of these within a standard amount of time. If you didn't do it within that time, off to the gulags with you. Kalashnikov based the AK-74 on the firing system of the AK-47, but with some major added upgrades here. So for example, its rate of fire is slightly faster at 650 rounds per minute. It weighed three and a half pounds less than its predecessor at a grand total of six pounds. It even had a better max effective range than its predecessor at 500 meters compared to the AK-47's 350 meters. And this is thanks to the lighter 545 by 39 millimeter round and the lower recoil. In fact, this was one of the main goals of its development in the first place. So the standard issue muzzle brake dispersed expended gases to the side, which greatly reduced recoil. In a lab test that measured the weapon's recoil, the AK-74 had 3.39 joules of energy versus the 7.9 joules of recoil energy from the AKM. The trade-off here is that reportedly if you're standing to the side of someone firing the rifle, you get a bit deafened. And more importantly, it created quite a huge big muzzle flash which if firing at night can give away the soldier's position. There's a very credible rumor out there that the head of the Pakistani intelligence agency said that the CIA paid 5,000 bucks for the first person to capture an AK-74 in the 1980s when the Russians were fighting in Afghanistan. They wanted to have one of these to study it. It must have been like winning the lottery back then because I think $5,000 in the 80s is like 2 million today. Hey, just your friendly neighborhood CIA agent here. No, you can trust me. Just bring me one of those AK-74s. I'll give you $5,000 and <laughs> I definitely won't be interrogating you. But why did it never reach popularity levels of Jocko Wilnick status? Because by then, many countries around the world were already sticking with their stock AK-47s. They figured those were good enough and they didn't want to take out a loan to upgrade to the newest version. So it looks like the Russian military could learn a thing or two from capitalism. You gotta keep them coming back, buying that newest crap, even if they don't need it. The firing and reload mechanisms are the same as the AKM. However, the AK-74 barrel got a complete makeover and improvement. With a new and improved barrel, it had the first signs of forward thinking in the form of support brackets for the underslung 40mm grenade launcher. Yet another concept they ripped off from the M16 when they saw that sweet, sweet American M203 grenade launcher. This part is really important. The AK-74 is the first AK series created to run an underslung GP-25 grenade launcher. The GP-25 was a Russian equivalent of the M203. It fired a 40 millimeter explosive round from a tiny tube located in the front of the rifle. It's very different though compared to the M203 American grenade launcher. And the reason for that is this one is muzzle loaded and has a very short barrel runway of only about 4.7 inches which keeps it very light and ideal for short range engagements within like 200 meters, but it's less durable than your M203. So you can only fire this thing about 400 times before it's completely destroyed. It had a bizarre bouncing grenade version called the VOG 25. This round had a small charge in the nose of the grenade that ricocheted it off the ground and raised it one meter into the air and then it detonated at around here height, brutal. It had a kill radius of six meters and it couldn't really be attached to the AK-47. 
This attachment really increased the AK-74 and by extension the Russian army's firepower. The ability to launch grenades in the AK-74 made the Russian army begin to realize just how important weapon attachments would be in the future. The whole reason the AK-74 was created was as an answer to the US M16 556 invention. The smaller cartridge proved to be the more effective one in the Cold War era, with countries like Israel copying the AK-47 and chambering it in the smaller cartridge with their Galil variant, they saw how effective the AK series could be in a smaller caliber. So what happened was, during the Cold War, the West and the East spied on each other constantly. They tried to loot one another's equipment to see what they were working with. It was a constant game of cat and mouse. And during the Vietnam War, the Russian army noticed the effective wounding properties of the US force's new 5.56 bullet. They even went as far as to experiment with drilling a small hole into the top of their bullets to see if it would fragment and break apart inside targets. These bullets tumbled inside a target, wounding them so that they would be carried off the battlefield. In other words, you're not just taking out one enemy of the fight, you're taking out two or three, because his mates have to carry him around to safety. Also, some of the added benefits here are that the soldiers can carry more ammo. They're weighed down less, because the ammo they carry is now lighter. The Soviets apparently agreed with this philosophy when they made the AK-74. They hoped that more lead flying down range would mean that you'd be more likely to hit targets. You heard them right, marksmen need not apply. Just like how the AK-74 is overlooked, so too is its inventor, because no one knows who A.D. Koreshinish Koreshin is. Koreshin is. See, I don't even know how to pronounce his name. But he was an amazing firearms developer, very influential. And him and his group helped design the AK-74 under the supervision of Kalashnikov. The easiest way to tell an AK-47 apart from an AK-74 is by looking at the magazine, because the shape of the smaller ammo means there's less curvature to the magazine for it to cycle reliably. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the Russian military was some of the first to start using plastic polymer magazines. The AK-74 was one of the first generations to use this rust-colored, epoxy-based magazine, and it really brought the weight down, and they were able to carry more ammo. One of the requirements of the round was that it needed to penetrate body armor, but the body armor of that era was mainly soft flak jackets, which didn't re really require a ton of innovation. Primarily, it was designed to penetrate as much as it could in the human body, causing as much damage as possible, and it could also still be lodged inside there. The Soviets found the 545 round was very effective, so much so that it even developed a reputation amongst its enemies. Shot up, Muhideen fighters who were carried or dragged back to their hideouts faced a bitter end. The enemy had no real medics or trained surgeons to perform proper medical treatment so they would bleed out slowly. The insurgents found the catastrophic effects of the Russian round so horrific that they started calling this 545 bullet the poison bullet. The iron sights stayed the same, but optics and night sights were purpose made for this rifle. The standard optical sight for the Soviet army, the 1P29, it's the universal sight for small arms. It's copied from the British suit or sight unit infantry trilux. Just like the AK itself, the 1P29 was made to be rugged, not like soft Western optics that require re-zeroing every time you climb out of a vehicle or sneeze a little too hard. The most fascinating variant and possibly the most easily visually distinguishable one is the AK-74U. It has a tiny eight inch barrel. When designing a smaller weapon, it's not as simple as just scaling down. By making the weapon smaller and shortening its operating mechanism, the cycle rate rose to 730 rounds per minute because it was lighter. Kharashina is needed to find a solution to effectively stabilize the projectiles, so they increased the barrel's twist rate. He installed a new gas block at the end of the muzzle with what was called a muzzle booster. It sounds like it increases the muzzle velocity, but what it actually does is it harnesses the power of the escaping gases to more reliably cycle the weapon. The AK-74's tiny barrel gives it a uniquely massive muzzle blast. It's giant, you can see the muzzle blast from space basically. They tried to dampen that with a muzzle booster as well. Shortened barrel means that the muzzle velocity is 500 feet per second slower. The AK-74U is designed to fill the space between assault rifle and submachine gun. In fact, it shows good forward thinking again in the modern world when you're looking at personal defense weapons. You could argue Cold War Russia already had a PDW. This weapon was made for soldiers in armored roles like tanks, artillery, helicopter crews, and special forces. 
Fun fact, if you don't already know this, Osama bin Laden's favorite weapon was the AK-74U. Some military experts say that the AK family will be in conflict zones for a lot longer than we think. It is of course being replaced now by the modern AK-12, AK-15, but I don't think we're ever going to truly see the end of the AK-74. How long do you think it'll stick around for? Did I miss any details? Let us know in the comments down below. I'm Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching Task and Purpose.